Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Uber Kodero show uh, for this evening. And this evening, we are hosting a South Sudanese guy named Peter Micah. And Peter Micah is a student at the College of Idaho. And he's joining us today to talk about his life growing up in South Sudan and in many other countries, um, uh, displaced by a war, so technically a refugee. Uh, but also overcoming all those challenges and becoming one of the smartest people I've met, very well disciplined. And we, I just wanted to share his story with the rest of everybody, but also to listen to him talk about his life so that we can know more about his country and his background. So if you're joining us for the first time, please do not forget to subscribe and to share and to comment on this show and, and suggest things that you think we should be doing going further. So, Peter, welcome to the show. How are you doing, Peter? I'm good. Thank you. Yeah. I'm pleased to be here. Yeah. As you said, my name is Peter. Um, I'm, I'm going to be a senior in the College of Idaho. I major in chemistry, biomedical science and philosophy. And yeah, I'm willing to talk about my experience being in war today and how it impacted me until I reached the United States. So it's, it's going to be a fun conversation and hope you guys liked it. Yeah, I'm sure we're going to learn from you, Peter, myself included, uh, but also our audience. So you are a triple major. How do you get the time to do all of this stuff? Chemistry, philosophy, and uh, what do you say again? Biomedical. Biomedical science. Yeah. Wow. Very yeah. smart guy. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't intending to do triple major. I I came here as a chemistry major. Mm. I started taking chemistry and I like philosophy a lot. So I every semester I just take two or three classes of philosophy. And then my advisor just told me, hey, Peter, if you just take another three philosophy classes and add it to the classes you, you took already, you're going to be a philosophy major. So I added that. And then I also like bio. So I took a lot of bio classes, which I ended up with triple major. That's how I ended up actually with triple major. It wasn't an intention, but <laughs> it's it did something happen. that just happened. Yeah. Wow. It's amazing. I mean, you definitely a bright student now. We are interested in how you got here. So it's going to be a long winded conversation, but hopefully in the midst of it, we're going to learn a lot more about your resilient strength and intelligence and all these good qualities that you you have. So tell us about your background. Where were you born and where you lived and how you identify yourself? <laughs> yeah, um, so I am born in Juba. Juba is the capital of South Sudan. Um, in 2011, when we got our independence, Juba was named as the capital of South Sudan. And oh, before I that, asked, yeah, I, thought, I thought you said you were born in 2011. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> no. Yeah. no, no, I said I was born in Juba. I was yeah. born in 1999. Okay. Um, yeah, by that, by, by that time, Juba was still part of the Southern Sudanese part, which is like Sudan as a whole, as a country. So we didn't get our self-determination until 2011. I was born in Juba, and my dad um, actually worked for the refugee uh, program, like in the war in 1990. So my dad was the one evacuating most of the refugee from uh, Sudan to Uganda. He mm -hmm. was the head of the convoy that would go through the, the road. And so my I have a lot of experience of how refugee life is. And my dad also used to tell me a lot of his stories. And I have one brother. His name is called Godfrey Christopher. And that's why he was born in Uganda. So by that time, my father was working as like um, leading the refugee convoy. So they got met with my mom and then they married. And when they went to Uganda, that's where my elder brother was born. Yeah. And I am from South Sudan. So one of the things in South Sudan is we have different ethnic groups and we have different tribes. Mm. So like, I know a lot of people know that um, from the conflict that happened in South Sudan, that there is a Dinka and a Nuer, but there's actually 64 ethnic groups in South Sudan and tribes, and they speak all different languages. And still yet other 
ethnic groups have not been identified because like the ones in the border we still didn't solve all the border problems and stuff but the main recognized one is 64 ethnic groups in South Sudan and I am from um, from my father's side I am from Moro ethnic group uh, Moro ethnic groups those are the people that live in the western equatorial state if you know about South Sudanese uh, geography you will know where the western equatorial state state is and my mom is from the central equatorial state the central equatorial state is where the capital is juba so it's basically been inhabited by all those like people that you call like the bari ethnic groups and then the, within the bari ethnic groups like those are the people that can understand each other they speak different languages but still they can understand each other so One language group, right? yeah group. yeah so from my father's side so in south sudan we we are always identified based on our fathers. So recently in my passport, they named me from Western Equatorial State because my father is from Western Equatorial State and my mom is actually from Central. So in South Sudan, it's kind of like you follow where your father is from and that's become how people identify you. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of like similar to how it is in Kenya. I mean, people, many contest that uh, male dominated identity centering but sometimes it's it's predominant in that case so now my understanding of south sudan is this and i could be wrong predominantly nilotic speakers people of ancestry from river lake uh nilots and uh, river lake which means the nile and the many lakes around the region and in and many of them are pastoralists, right? And some of them are fisher, fishermen. They uh, fish from the lake. And uh, I, then there is ethnicity as in the construct of it, which is the creation of like Arab culture within as the hegemonic culture. At the top, so many South Sudanese people do speak some sort of Juba Arabic because of uh, Arabic domination for like centuries, like thousands of years. And then below that, there is these big ethnic groups that are known that are, have been involved in a civil war. One being the Nuer, it's like 30%, are they? Um, it will be approximately 30%, but a bit less than that. Like probably I would say like 27%. I'm not accurate with the statistics, but they are the majority, it's like the Nuer and the Dinkas here. Yeah. yeah, and then the Dinka. And then the Dinka also divide between the Dinka boar and the other Dinka, right? Yeah. So then, so those are what people know. When people think about South Sudan, they think about the Dinka, they think about the Nuer, and then they, talk, they think about this Arab conflict that was like racialized in many ways between uh, light-skinned Arabs and dark-skinned to the South Sudanese. People don't think about people in the middle. Mm -hmm. of mixed marriages or people who are dark skinned Sudanese but living in the north and uh, these are the small groups which you happen to belong to yeah they kind of get lost in the conversation yeah uh, my ethnic group always get lost in the conversation like every time people talk about South Sudan they just focus on the newer and the ethnic mm. like if you go back to history <laughs> mm. like if you, South Sudan, when Sudan was a whole, before the entrance of the Arabs in Sudan, mm. actually the Dinkas and the Nuers were living up in the north. And then the other ethnic groups, like where I am, and then there are some other tribes, we are the ones who live in the south. But then when, during the entrance of Arabs into Sudan, they got pushed towards southern part of, of, of Sudan, and that's how we ended up together. And most of those people that live in the north, those are actual people that... Uh, raise a lot of kettles. That's why, like, one of the things, if you search about South Sudan in YouTube or any kind of social media, you will see a lot of cows and those stuff. Those actually belong to those people. Those are the Dinka, the Nuer. But then most of the people in the South, they're agrarian, actually. They like vegetation, grow a lot, but we never grow a lot of kettles and stuff like that. And you don't keep cattle. Yes, we grow a little bit, but we are not known by, like, having, like, a lot of cattles around us. We are identified as agrarian. We, most of the people in the southern part of South Sudan, they grow a lot of crops. That's how they live their life. 
but people in the north, those are the cattle raisers. Those are the Dinkas, <coughs> the Nuev, the Shuluk, Anuak. Like, they are different type of people, but we all have different as our Sudanese. But at the same time, you can distinguish us just based on how we live our life and how we basically socialize our life. So when you look in YouTube and those stuff, and you type something about South Sudan, and then they brought for you cattle, so know that immediately those are the North South Sudanese. Those are the people that live in the North. So that's why South Sudan is actually beautiful, because like you can literally cut South Sudan into half. In the North, it's just desert, and then swamp areas. But then when you come to the South, it's just green. And actually, when you identify it like that, people who live in the South, that's why I say they're agrarians, because the land is green and they cultivate a lot. And then people who live in the north, because there's swampy areas, so you have a lot of grasses and those stuff. That's why they specialize in like raising a lot of cattle, and then cattle becomes part of their like social life, used for marriages and all those stuff. Yeah. I read a book that educated me a lot on South Sudan. It's called Fast Race of Flag. It's written by a British journalist. Uh, very insightful analysis of the dynamic there. Part of the argument that this guy makes is that South Sudan has kind of suffered this history of conflict for thousands of years, you know, like it's not new and domination and slavery and all this sort of thing because of the presence of just the Egyptian North, because Egypt was super advanced civilization. And as Arabs move in there from uh, Arabia, they push down this Nubians and, and other black people south. And as they push these people south, they create conflicts because of squabble for faith, for uh, space. Yeah. So the the influence of the then the Ottomans come and the Ottomans are like slave raiding people uh, who had no history uh, with, with darker skinned people and they they uh, kind of slavery was really rapacious, like it was terrible. So then people move down farther, and then you have this subsequent movement of people, agrarian people, cattle keeping people across the Great Lakes region and in the Horn of Africa. That's yeah. because of very fascinating, I thought. Yeah, it's really it's really interesting. Like <coughs> Sudanese history, like if you read it in depth, is one of the like really interesting history you mm -hmm. find because like the Ottomans, the Anglo Egyptian rule in Sudan. The first missionaries to visit actually Africa were in Sudan, which is like very interesting because like we have a very intense history. And then when you try to go back into that, those all of those histories are the one that led to actually um, South Sudan to have self autonomy because like there's so many stuff that happened every time a new regime come, like the Ottomans come and go, the Anglo came and go in. So all those one is the one that led to all those tensions between those regions, like pushing people from one place, creating a conflict about this space, different tribal occupying different places across the country. It's kind of like those are the things that actually led to like South Sudan to have like kind of like internal conflicts. Yeah. Yeah, that's a um, very rich analysis. Now, um, so I think we've talked a little bit about this already. Uh, tell us about South Sudan right now. Like we've talked about the history that forms it, but can you give us a brief run rundown of what leads to South Sudan as an independent republic? And then briefly explain the South's history and why the cessation, the creation of a new state in 2011 was very important. Mm -hmm. So, um, like the main reason why South Sudan actually um, calls for like self autonomy is basically like you know that there's different religions, there the Arabs and then the, the other people like for example like me, which are right now I identify myself as Christian this is that. But one of the important thing is actually the conflict in South Sudan have never been like based on religion, but instead it's been based on like differences, like different racial groups like ethnicity and those stuff. Those are the things that actually led to South Sudan to have self autonomy because after the Anglo-Egyptian rule, those are the Anglo-Egyptian rule is when the Egyptian and the British came together to colonize 
uh, Sudan. Like when they colonized Sudan, they established a platform. And by that time, most of the people, especially the blacks, they were illiterate and they, they, they don't know how to speak like other languages, like for example, Arabic. They don't have any kind of like um, writing styles or something like that. So mostly most of the people that are black, they are illiterate by that time. And then when the Egyptian, when the British actually left, they left all the government infrastructures, all those platforms that they made, they left it into the hands of the Arabs because the Arabs were the one going to school. So that's the thing that created actual tension because that's one of the things about colonization. Like when they colonize, they train one specific group of people to take over and then the other group has been marginalized. So most of the black people were actually marginalized by the Arabs when the British left and um, they are the one that start establishing Khartoum by that time. Um, before Khartoum, actually, it was Ondurman as the capital of Sudan as whole. And then Khartoum development start happening in the north. And then in the south, because those people are illiterate, they don't know how to write. And they're still having those all that we talked about, like raising cattle, being agrarians. They actually look at them like being animals because like, raising cattle, they live with cattle. And actually that's not something very like vague. It's something that's true. Like people in the southern part of in the northern part of South Sudan that raise cattle, they value cattle's life more than like I would I would roughly say more than human life. Like for them cattle is something very important. They they are willing to sacrifice their life just for their cattle. So that's that's one of the things that actually make those people in the north, and specifically that would be the Arabs, to look at most of the South Sudanese to be kind of like having animalistic nature in their like being human because they look and then they see how those people treat animals. So they actually call us animals, but it's only specific people. And it created tension because like those South Sudanese, the other people that have never been talked about and the one that disappeared in the middle, some of them actually know stuff. They know how to like read. Some of them were educated because the Arabs actually consider those people in the middle to be the one that actually can understand all stuff like that. So they took them and then they start training them. And then it start creating tension within the country. So like South Sudanese, most of the South Sudanese didn't want themselves to be like recognized as being animals. And they also wanted the opportunity to be like in the government, to go to school. Because by time, when time went, most of the South Sudanese also went to school and they start getting educated. But then because the Arabs dominate everything, so it's kind of created this like difference between the two sides, the Arabs and then the Blacks, means basically that inhabited the southern part. And that's the main reason why South Sudan actually went to civil war is because, actually because of those differences, then you have the SPLM rising and all this stuff. Then that become a different part of history. But this is the main reason that made South Sudanese to actually go for civil war and they want their self-autonomy because they don't want to be under the Arabs anymore. They want it to be like, as people that can rule themselves. Because by time when they went to school, they know now how to read, how to write. And so they don't want those marginalization that has been done by all the Arabs in, in the North. Yeah. And um, you also asked about um, in 2011, <coughs> right? When South Sudan um, basically um, recognized as a country. Yeah, so after, so the civil war, that happened, it lasted for 21 years. The Civil War lasted for 21 years. And in 2005, that's when um, we actually signed the Comprehensive Peace Agreement to bring the session of hostilities to an end. And in the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, they basically gave five years interim period for the Arabs to um, basically make southern part of Sudan to be actually developed and whether they will have like a very transition government that can balance between the two states. It's not like literally states, but uh, different states that were in the southern part of Sudan. And then in these five years, the Arab didn't do anything. So that's why South Sudan's call for referendum 
So that five interim period that has been given was supposed to be the time that the Arabs would unite with the Southern Sudanese. So in case we reach a referendum, South Sudanese can decide whether they wanted to be like a separate country or they wanted to go back as unity and have a Sudan as a whole. But then within these five years, nothing happened. And then South Sudanese decided to go for a referendum and they voted to have like a self determined country, which is basically being declared in 2011 in 9th July. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a very clear rundown. You know, many, many people don't know this, but uh, apartheid regime is on, was on, on not only in South Africa. Mm. There are several African countries that had apartheid like structures. Maybe not, not the same. Uh, <clears throat> name wasn't called like that, but the practices were that way. One was South Sudan. So what were the Arabs not? Not the all Arab community, but the Arab political elite from Khartoum were doing in the South was apartheid regime, continuing what was started by the British. Another one was Liberia, where you have like these Afro-American, American Liberians practically denying civil rights to native Liberians leading to a civil war as well. Or uh, you, you you had a, a, a party right, like regime in, like, in Algeria as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, leading to the war in Paris, one of the longest in Africa. You also had a party like regime in Kenya. People don't know this. Yeah. Until, <laughs> until 1954, I think, uh, uh, we have a state of emergency and then Mama war for liberation. One of these things, all of these conflicts had one thing in common, is that the people knowingly aware that economic pursuits would be endangered, decided to pursue self-determination, which is in itself a yeah. very noble goal. So the discourse of whether South Sudan was ready for independence should not be weighed out on economic terms. They were aware. But they really needed respect, and that is more important. Freedom and self-governance is sometimes more important than that. these are the issues. Yeah, that could be secondary. But I wanted to push back to you on that the idea that that the South Sudanese, maybe Northern or Central people, they had no idea of how to run society. No, they were the oldest people who had lived by the Nile. They had technology. They, that was suitable to living by the Nile. They had thousands of years of, of, of civilization. Just the absence of writing or reading doesn't mean people and our people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we tend to think that because we've been taught in the last hundred years to equate uh, humanity and civilization with written record. Doesn't have to be. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, I, I completely agree with you. But on a historical context, that's actually the that that's the igniting flame for the conflict itself. Because like most of the people in the southern Sudan were being dehumanized, like they because of their cattle, like the ability of like living with cattle, raising cattle, sacrificing their life for cattle. So people literally like dehumanized them. Like they thought like those people. And actually, when you go back to all history books, I know it's been written by men and all this stuff. It's actually written exactly like the animals. Like that's how the Arabs wrote the yeah, South yeah. Sudanese history. Yes, exactly. Um, if if my father, so I will always get these stories from my father because my father lived in all those eras. Um, he knew exactly how people treated them, and my father will tell me exactly like. Back then in history, when we were young, we were literally called the animals. And then the first history books that I actually read, that they read to us in the school, and that was in North Sudan, and it's in Arab school. And in that book, it's so we didn't they didn't have actually a word for like like Southern Sudanese because we live in the South, so we become like the Southern Sudanese. But instead, they will always say the animals. You see, which is kind of interesting. Like I know I'm, I'm completely disagreeing with that, but that's actually what happened, and that's what South Sudan is. So it's yeah. not like these people internalize this thing. It's just yeah. how they saw them. Yeah, exactly. But it's not like the South Sudanese people. Uh, oh, we accept that we are animals, or something. But that's how they saw them. And, yeah. and 
they saw them so strongly that they waged a war in order mm -hmm. to maintain their animal status. Yeah. Can yeah. You think and, about and, that <laughs> for a minute, huh? Yeah, it's kind of interesting because, like, I don't know, maybe by that time they have a lot of incentive. Maybe they are referring to the people who raised the animals and they call them the animals. Maybe they didn't exactly mean that those people are less than human or something like that. So that's why I said, like, because it's in a historical context, that's why I'm saying it like that. But I, I because I didn't live in that. And then most of the time I listen to stories, especially like from our parents and from our grandparents. One of the th greatest thing about Africa as whole, you know, like sometimes you have those flame nights where you sit down and your father start narrating his stories and his stuff so that you know a lot of your history, your origin. Yeah. So most of the time when we are raised as a kids, we will sit down and then we'll have one of our elders will tell us like fun, fast hand first-hand information because they actually lived on that and they will literally tell us that we are telling you that not because we fooled it or we added our own vocabularies in it to make it sound bad but that's exactly how people used to call us this is how it is it so, is what it is yeah exactly oh my god so now how did this war affect you like where did you end up living in and how was it like living there um I didn't live a lot in South Sudan. I, I lived in South Sudan after 2011. That's when I lived a lot in South Sudan. But my parents are the ones that lived a lot in, in, um, in the southern part of Sudan. And so my, my, my parents were literally living up just in the border with Uganda and Kenya. Mm. Like the place is called Ye. Like if you go further to the south, right into the border. I don't know if you know Kaya. Kaya is a border between South Sudan and Uganda. Mm. And it's not actually too far to Kenya. So it's kind of like a triple border place. My parents used to live there. And then during the civil war, um, Espelain came and took that place. And the Northern Sudanese um, army were evacuating the place. So they literally <coughs> forced all the civilians from that place that called Ye to basically exit because it's now selling with guns and stuff. So my parents literally were forced to move from like Ye to the capital of, of Juba, of South Sudan right now, Juba. So mm. they came like barefooted from that place, which is like 100 miles. It took them like seven days because they were in the middle and then they were surrounded by all this Northern Sudanese army. And then the SPLM were taking the place. So my parents ended up in the capital, and then from the capital, they moved. There, there were a planes that those Arabs take South Sudanese from the south, because SPLM is now taking all the places in the south. So there, there were refugee programs, and then our, my parents got registered into it, and they traveled to North Sudan. But by the time they're traveling to North Sudan, that's actually when I was born. I was born in 1990. 1999, and my parents moved from Juba in 1990, uh, in 2001. In 2001, mm. that's when my parents moved to uh, to the capital in Khartoum, and that's where I was raised. And I um, went to my primary school there. I would sometimes visit back home, like in South Sudan, like just visiting times. But then most of my education until primary seven, I studied in Northern uh, Sudan, and then in 2011, that's when my family decided to come back to South Sudan because we got our self um, autonomy. So we came back to our country, and I also went to Ethiopia for some time, studied there, and then I finished my high school back. I came back to South Sudan, finished my high school, and that's when I applied to UWC and I got a scholarship to go to Italy. It's kind of like very interesting journey. I lived in these old places when I was a kid, and then it all led me to like exit South Sudan for education, yeah. Hmm. Wow, a lot of moving parts. Mm. But, you know, it, it's not easy living in a conflict area, uh, even though you're like second generation, so you know, have like first-hand experience of it. But uh, just hearing your loved one experience this pain and uh, your grandparents experiencing, it, ha it carries some burdens, emotional burdens that we often work with 
not knowing that they had us. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that people don't have to be uh, physically brutalized by war and conflict. They can also be brutalized, be brutalized by the experiences of their four, 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 four parents, four, pa four fathers and moms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, every time I listen it from my parents, I always, um, I don't take it into full consideration because I didn't experience all these things. Mm. But then in 2013, when our civil war started, that's when I was in South Sudan. So both of them were in 2013. And then in 2016, yeah. I was there in South Sudan. And in 2016, actually, the war started. It started in different places, but it was fought in the same city where I lived. So the, the city where I live, it's their battleground. So like up in the mountain, yeah. So I was in Juba, and then in 2016 the war started in the presidential palace, and then they moved toward the mountains because the rebels who are literally up in the mountains on the other side, and mm. on on the other side of the mountain was the government. So, so tell us a little bit for the sake of the audience to understand what's happening in 2015. You got independence in 2011. Everything is gravy. Everybody is happy. And uh, Silva Kier, Kier is being declared president, right? Mm -hmm. So what happened? Rick Macha is deputy president, right? Yeah. So what happened in 2013? Um, so in 2013, actually, the, the, the war started when um, it, I know you know about the SPLM party, right? SPLM is the Sudan's People Liberation movement and yeah. they have also an army so SPLM is Sudan's People Liberation Army those are the, so the SPLM is the party that actually fought during the during the civil war of uh, Sudan when South Sudan was fighting for this for their self um, autonomy so yeah. after after we got our independence SPLM remained as a party and it was the strongest party in South Sudan it was the party that actually controlled the presidency the president was the chairman of the SPLM, and then Riyak Mashar was the DPT. So um, in 2013, the SPLM party has to now go to like it's called like national convention, where they actually um, change the primaries. So all those people that are top, they call it the top 11 in the SPLM. They mm. basically um, is a time where people go for election. And then they wanted to substitute those people. So um, the, the president was the chairman, Riyad Mashal was the DBT. And during the national convention, so um, Riyad Mashal was actually going to run for becoming the chairman of the SPLM. And there were so many other political uh, people that actually wanted, like, I know, I don't know if you know General Paganamun. Um, he was one of the political figures. He was the one that was signing. If you look at videos, there was someone signing the Comprehensive Peace Agreement in 2005. That's Paganamu, like, doing the signature. He was also going to run. And then you have Mama Rebecca, his uh, Jongeren uh, wife, mm. late Jongeren wife, also going to run for all the chairman and stuff. And then, because Riyad Mashar was winning popularity within the party and the stuff. So the president felt threatened that he's going to lose the election and he's not going to be the chairman anymore. So what he did is he basically um, removed Riyad Machar from vi being vice president. And then he basically make a dissolution in all his cabinet. So Riyad Machar was removed from his presidency also, the president cut the power of the vice president because it's in the constitution of South Sudan that it's one of the powers that the president has, if you read the constitution of South Sudan. So he cut the powers of the vice president. He removed Riyad Mashar from vice president and he dissolved all his cabinet. And But that actually didn't lead to a lot of tension in South Sudan because Riyad Mashar still was going to run for being the chairman of the SPLM. And the president doesn't have the right to remove him from the SPLM party, and he was the DVD. So all the cabinet that was sacked came and to, to um, Riyad Machar and like told him um, to use his power as being like a DBT in the SPLM party. Um, 
so what happened is the president in that's that's now in December the 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 war in our civil war actually started in December right so in December um, the 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 people that were sacked from the cabinet from um, with to, from the cabinet of the vice president and together with Riyadh they actually had a um, political um, rally because mm. they wanted to like convince people um, they were doing like a campaign for their election and stuff. And then the president felt threatened with that, like, well, and then he called a meeting exactly on that day. <coughs> we just stopped the, the, um, the rally and he dressed in a military, um, his military clothes. And then he went like for a conference in TV. And actually I watched that, con I, I remember I watched the, the conference that he had in, he was wearing um, his all, um, uniform and then he was actually training we didn't know about that until the time for the war he was actually training a specific group of uh, military people and the chief of his staff the ministry of defense didn't know that the president was training those people he was training he was the one financing them and they were trained like for eight months i think and then all the people um who we started the war, we're actually wearing the same uniform that the president did. And, and the president basically in that, um, in that um, conference, he basically declared a national curfew from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. to make everyone at home. And then in that night, that's when the fighting started because those armies start, actually start killing people and then we can hear gunshots. So that's how the war started. It's just basically the tension between the president and the vice president and most of the people that he sacked from um, the office of the vice president. And it led to, and then because the president is from Dinka and then Riyad Mashar is from Nuer, then later on it actually turned into like a tribal conflict. And then that's why people know that if you Google right now, that's when people know that, oh, South Sudan has a civil war and it's between Dinka and Well, It's because later on when the war started and it's been going, it actually turned into ethnic group and just two tribes start murdering themselves. Yeah. And that's how, like, basically the war started in, um, in 2013 in South Sudan. Yeah. Wow. Uh, last time I checked, it was close to a million people, right? The number of deaths? Yeah, not directly from the conflict, but also from famine caused by the war. Oh yeah, I don't know exactly the statistics <coughs> uh, because right now most of the South Sudanese are actually displaced and refugees. So exactly, I don't know how many people actually died in total because of the conflict, because there is famine, um, people actually die on the road while they are traveling to other countries seeking for like refuge and stuff. And also, the conflict itself killed a lot of people because once it turned into a tribal conflict, it's, and you know, tribal conflict is literally a massacre. And then when you go to the north, it was basically the Dinkas fighting the Nuer and they would kill themselves. Yeah. But I don't know exactly the statistic, how many people died. Yeah. But it's, it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's been categorized as one of the most, uh, uh, you know, Harbour King situation is in the North and Great Lakes region of Africa. Now, you already told us that you came through a scholarship on the United States, uh, United uh, World College system, right? So tell us a little bit about this. How did you get this spot? And then where did you go after that? Yeah, um, yeah. so I, when... <clears throat> and what, okay, fine. Lastly, what was trained in this journey so you can have the space? Can you say the last question again? What was strange in the journey? Oh, okay. Um, I will start by actually telling how I ended up going to <laughs> UWC. So um, when I finished my high school, um, I applied to UWC and um, I got accepted to UWC. So um, UWC in, in our country, we have a national committee. It's called South Sudan uh, UWC National Committee. And people basically apply through national committees to go to UWC East Coast. And basically they choose students from 
the, the lucky part about my life is when I was in South Sudan, when I came back, I was studying in one of the best high school in the entire country. So I was studying there and then I got good results and then UWC nominate students that can apply, that can try to apply to the UWC program. And then um, I got reached out and I applied for it. And then I did several of interviews and some oral written interviews. And then I got nominated and they sent me to Italy. And that's how I started my journey outside again. So I started going to UWC Adriatic in Italy. We studied there for like um, two years before coming to uh, applying to US after UWC Adriatic. And of course, there are so many stories in the middle, especially like being a black going out from Africa, didn't know exactly how the West lived their life, what type of environment is there. There's so many challenges that we face, different challenges, racial challenges, a lot of stuff, but we learned how to go through that, and yeah. And well, I can tell. You Italy? I can tell uh, a little bit of the stories that actually happened, and and, I, and that I felt like it's very interesting. Yeah. Tell me the stories of, in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so one of the <laughs> things that was actually very remarkable from me starting out from Africa and going to Europe was actually um, cultural shock, because. Imagine me going from um, Sudan. I didn't know anything about like, you know, like freedom, like all those um, LGBTQ stuff, you know, like I didn't know all about this. one. And then the first I went with actually one of my friend um, is called Emmanuel Boboya. We went and um, one of the things that's very strange is how we can actually cope to live in an environment where you can see like the same sexes together, you know? This is one of the cultural shock that I, that, that I have to experience and I have to deal with because my, my, my roommates, um, my roommates were straight, but then Boboya, the other guy from South Sudan, his roommate was a gay. So most of the time he would live there and then he would, and then when he see those people um, having their affairs, he would literally run to my room and then sleep in my room because he's, he thought that he was, wasn't comfortable. So it's one of the very interesting things that happened to me, uh, especially learning how to live in an environment that actually have those type of like um, different culture from the way that I was grown up uh, with. So it's kind of like very interesting. This is one of the things that we have to face, um, deal with. And I, I think like we coped with it very well. And now we are very open people. And another thing is racism. And it's something real, you know. Uh, racism for me, I define racism as like something, it's a psychological concept, you know. Like what you consider as racial, I, I might not see as being racism, you know. So like, but I encounter some of the events that actually happen in Europe, like people will see me walking and then they will come out from the restaurant and then they start, hey, can I what can I have a picture with you? And then call all their family out to have a picture. <laughs> uh, I was I remember on one of our project week in UWC, we have something called Project Week where students lead a project and then they do it to like it can be based on education, science, whatever. So it's one intense week where you do some services outside from the campus. So my project week was in Bosnia Herzegovina, and one of the things that I had to encounter is actually how we got restricted in the border because we have different nationalities. If you know UWC accept people from all of, around the world, so we have multiple nationalities, and we are traveling, and um, we are on the border. It was actually um, Austrian border, I guess. Yeah, it's in the. No, no, no. It's not Austrian border. It's. Um, Croatia. So we are moving from Italy and then we went, the bus took us to Croatia and then when we exit in Croatia and we're going to Bosnia, so in the border, so they have to stop the car and then check all our, because uh, we didn't have, we just have the Schengen visa, you know, that can allow you to move just within the Schengen, but going to Bosnia, Bosnia is not part of the Schengen. So it was kind of very difficult and it's one of the things that I had to encounter, the differences in passport. I would always listen to these uh, stories from other people, how 
they have like border problems and stuff, but then that one I get to experience it. It was kind of like very something that is rooted right now in me because it was very good experience that I have to experience this thing on my own, you know? Like um, they did all the check, they look at our passport and everything, and then there's one of my friends from Afghanistan. He has his passport just because of his passport. So they have to make us all come back again and then do the checking again. So in the border, we spent like around one hour, 30 minutes, basically just going through all the security stuff, which is kind of like also another interesting stuff that I did experience in Europe. Yeah. But you thrive through it and you're yeah. strong and you're smart and you're doing very well and kind. Now, the thing about racism is that many people don't understand it, but at the heart of it, it's not. Yes, there's some crazy people there who still think people of darker skin are animals, but uh, or should be treated like animals. But that's just surface level racism. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the one of it is just a guess. Like if you go to Asia or China or Japan. People look at you, want to take pictures with you. They're curious. That is just curiosity. Yeah. That is based on innocence because you've not seen mm -hmm. somebody like that. Yeah. The the worst part of it is when decisions are made or policy is made to segregate or to dehumanize certain aspects or to deny them opportunity. That is the most dangerous part. Yeah, so exactly. I'm less concerned about people looking at me because of my blackness and it happens quite a lot mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm honest with you the higher you crime in the social ladder the more you're gonna find yourself in spaces where you're the only and that's been my, my experience for like a long time now mm -hmm. yeah, and it's something and it's yeah. actually something common you know like even if white people go to africa like sometimes we want to take pictures and sometimes we look at them like completely different because yeah they look different from us especially like um in my when you go deep in in the village in south Sudan, like there are some people that didn't see even white people before and then when they have that experience for the first time so it, they will kind of have the same reaction which is yeah but that's that's uh, yeah. I those are the basic that, ones that's based on ignorance yeah. The second one, which is based on mal malice or malicious intention, that is the one that is dangerous. Mm -hmm. That's the one yeah. where you will be fighting. Yeah, and that's and that's the one that I get to experience actually here in the United States, but I didn't get to experience that in Europe. Oh, which the is one kind of really very interesting. Strange, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. What yeah. So you know, the one in Europe was kind of like one of ignorance. Yeah. Exactly. I don't know. I've never seen these people. I don't know how to deal with them. Yeah. But when one which you get segregated just because of your blackness, that is the one that is psychologically ouch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> huh? Yeah, that's the that, that's the bad one. And 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 I I will actually sometimes I contemplate with myself <laughs> like exactly what might be the difference because like I lived in Europe for two years and I didn't encounter like a very severe racist. Um, I know it's it's happening somewhere, but me personally, I didn't get to experience some serious racial thing that people actually discriminate me or something like that. But in the United States, just in the airport, it boom, just happened, you know? And I, 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 that's the first time I just experienced that, oh, actually racism is something real because like when I lived in Europe, for me, I know racism is real and it's happening somewhere around the world, but I didn't experience it. And I didn't have any clue like how to handle this situation. And then in the United States, the moment I just came in and then uh, in the checkout, like the person was asking for my um, passport and I put my passport inside um, one of the cases. And then I wanted to remove the thing. He just pulled it from my hand and ripped the thing out, which is like I, I, I felt like this, this is something never happened to me. But the moment I was entering the United States, it just happened, which is kind of like, I started to know that racism is actually real because like, those are the type of racism. I, I don't know, like I, I, that's why I said from the beginning, racism is something dynamic, you know? Like it's a concept that, it, is it real, but it's a concept that we actually get to define it based on our experiences. Like for example, 
what happened to me, some, someone else might see, might see it not being racist, you know? But then what happened to someone else, I might see it either racism or not. It just depends on how I define it, you know? But it's something real and it exists. That's why, like, from the moment I went to the air, I was in the airport in the United States, I saw that as, okay, this is really a practical racism I am experiencing right now. That's how I, I, I defined it, yeah. See, when I came to the United States, then I went back to Africa for some time. And I used to experience people being racist on me all the time because I was now hyper conscious about it. And guess what? This is the funny stuff. When, like, colonized people or dominated people can internalize how they have been othered to make it seem as if they own, have ownership of those qualities as described. Like you were talking about the Arabs describing Southern Sudanese as animals, right? Some people over time, for over an years and years, they start to think, oh, maybe we are animals. And then they try to treat yeah. their people mm -hmm. that way. So yeah. for me, I've had like maybe four or five incidences where I felt like either the police, I'm talking about Kenya, I'm from Kenya, were racist to me without knowing that they were. Mm -hmm. I've been treated wrong in a restaurant. I've been into a neighborhood where I felt like I was questioned why I was there. And uh, you, you, United States is currently, I won't even mention it, <laughs> uh, how many times. But I, the point I want to make is that we shouldn't just think that it happens in Western spaces. Yeah. Yeah, because we have been, many people have internalized it and might not know, might not be aware. So what's racist to me is not, maybe not to you. Yeah. Yeah. But I thought of, so, so anyway, just to wind up, um, you've talked about racism. Do you think, are you hopeful about South Sudan? I am hopeful about you. I, I know you're going to do well. I know you're going to be a brilliant person who's going to do a lot of things. But do you think you represent South Sudan or do you think, are you hopeful about South Sudan? Uh, when it comes to hopeful, I'm kind of uh, hopeful to South Sudan to just a certain extent. Um, I'm not going to try to push it uh, too far, but, um, <clears throat> but the thing about South Sudan right now, um, this is just based on my explanation because I, I, I'm, for, I'm monitoring the situations actually happening there. Um, South Sudan is actually, uh, right now it's stable because we literally signed um, the peace agreement and both Riyadh Mashar and um, Salva Kiir, they're all in Juba right now so they're trying to like bring like political stability so yeah so recently south sudan is stable but then um for me personally i think like south sudan economically and politically still need a lot of work to be done because like um even if i was kind of like monitoring a lot of the peace talks that led to like the peace agreement recently and they didn't actually talk about any serious thing that led to the conflicts. Instead, they actually, if you look at the, like the peace agreement, it's just basically about power sharing. And that's, that's the one problem that a lot of African leaders are actually hiring for. Like they just want position in the, in the government. And if you look at the peace agreement, like it's all about like, who is gonna take this position and this stuff. Yeah, they just want positions and this. And that's why South Sudan ended up right now with four vice presidents, which is something very unique in history because there is no country that had a lot of like. It's very rare. So that's four why vice presidents. Yeah, exactly. We have. Is it four? It's actually five, five vice presidents, and then it's like I don't know how they're gonna sustain that, and I don't know even how that peace agreement is gonna last because the main reason that actually led to the conflicts. Like I told you from the beginning, like it's all about the constitution, giving the president a lot of power to do a lot of his stuff and all this. So in the peace agreement, instead of talking about that, they didn't talk about that. So, you know what? Peter Martin, who I read his book, First Race of Flag, he calls it the big tent. You know, you know the big tent, like a, uh, 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 what is this guy? Sil Silva Kier, right? Silva Kier, yeah. Silva Kier. 
uh, his way of managing the situation is inviting people and co-opting them into the government. Yeah. And then once they are co-opted, they are military. The military group that they created is also co-opted in the South Sudan army. And then yeah. you have people. When you yeah. run out of money, like he did when he closed up the oil taps, mm -hmm. these people leave. And then they cause havoc in the villages. Isn't that right? Yeah. Exactly. And and that's why actually you have a lot of like military groups in South Sudan because like in the South Sudanese they think that if you are militarized then you are strong and then no one has the power to take you from the place that you have. And that's how South Sudan ended up with a lot of like those small military groups and stuff. Now they're trying to nationalize the army, but there is no active like integrity going on like in how to do those like um unification of those army but uh, that, that's why like i can't tell exactly whether i'm hopeful or not hopeful about south sudan because there's some aspect that is good but then when you go into depth may, maybe because i studied a lot of political uh, economy classes and stuff that's why i'm looking at all those loop of holes but then in long run like the peace agreement itself it's not sustaining because they didn't talk about the real problem we're going to call it over there. I, you know, one thing I'm hopeful about, I'm hopeful about you. I know you are going to do well and uh, you're going to touch a lot of lives and your story has been amazing. Your insights is great. And we know that the future of Southern South Sudan is bright because we have very smart students coming from there like you are. So thank you yeah. for coming up. We're grateful for your time and we hope to hear from you again. Yeah, right. Thank you for having me. You're welcome.